start with the questions. Start the recording. All right. So Hayden, the first question is: um, What relationship do you have with your younger self? How do you see this person, and how would you describe him? Um. So. My younger self, I guess. Um, it's kind of something that I've worked on recently, actually. Because um, in, in a meditation not too long ago, I was sort of in meditation, and I I noticed like my inner child kind of like came up, which I I don't like people talking about like like woo woo stuff I don't like it but like I literally like had like an inner version of myself like come up like as like a child version of me and the inner child was like scared and afraid and like um you know just just felt like there wasn't security and safety you know and so when I felt that I was like oh like it's okay I've got you you know I'll protect you now like I, I've got your back it's not um um, you know, you don't have to be afraid anymore. Like I'll do my best. I might not always protect you, but like, just know that I'm always going to be there for you. Um, and so I didn't really know that, um, that part of myself was sort of damaged in a way, I guess part of me knew, but I, I hadn't experienced it firsthand until like, I actually like encountered that part of myself that was damaged. Um, and so my relationship with my inner child is, is like, it's a growing one. It's a developing one. It's not one that like, um, I, I, I wouldn't say is like complete or whole. I haven't like, I don't feel like I have a full relationship with it yet, but I think it's something that, um, we'll probably need some more healing and some more work. Um, probably honestly till the day I die to some degree, but, um, I think, um, I think that's pretty common. Like pretty much every kid goes through something traumatic in their life or something hard and someone wasn't there to support them or someone wasn't there to have their back. And so they, they get hurt um, and insecure and, and you know, um, I think that's, that's just how the system works. Um, but what was the second half of the question? Uh, how do you see this person and how would you describe him? The person, the, my inner child is very playful, like very, like kind of curious and just like enjoys being alive, but also like wants to, um, like wants to understand life better, like really wants to like know what's, what's going on, you know, like, well, like kind of what I do now, you know, exploring like spirituality and exploring like um, but not in like a super intense, like this is important kind of way, but kind of like a playful, like it's all good, humorous kind of way, you know? Um, so, yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next question. No comments. <laughs> uh, all right. So, okay. I, I, I will have to relate an experience because it's written and like the question won't make sense if I don't read it. So I have to. Yeah, no, you can share things. Uh, not like <laughs> okay okay you don't have to uh, muzzle yourself <laughs> uh yeah no i have to man i have to because uh, otherwise we'll never get through this yet seriously okay. Okay. uh okay so a fellow psychotic person sat next to me in the rehab on my third day while i was smoking a cigarette and was symptomatic and all ha had almost no insight he whispered what you hear in your head are voices. They are not real. And I looked at him with disbelief and confusion and anger because I didn't ask him anything. Mm -hmm. So how did you react to receiving the information the first time when, of course, you had certain ideas about what you are going through in your psychosis, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was this one person who told you the, the, the way you are believing in things, that's not the case. And this is the reality and then maybe threw some jargon at you so how did you did you readily accept it or did you fight it and how did you react to that information the first step mm -hmm. so i think my first reaction was like rejection like i i didn't want to believe that and so i kind of fought back against it 
Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to go like back to that place where I can like remember sort of how I felt. Um, hmm. I don't know. I think um, I remember one time I was in the hospital and this guy told me that I was like messing up my life that I needed to like um, cause he knew I did drugs or something. He's like, you have good parents and you have like, you know, an amazing support system and like, you're fucking up your life. Like what's wrong with you and stuff. And like, I kind of heard what he said and I was just like, okay, this guy is like full of shit. Like he, he obviously doesn't, he doesn't know me. He hasn't talked to me. He hasn't learned yeah. my story. So yeah. I was able to, to kind of separate, like, I, I didn't internalize that at all. Cause I was like, this guy doesn't know me at all. Like he hasn't asked me any questions. So I, I was able to get past that. Um, but I, I guess I was pretty, I was pretty intuitive during my psychosis. So I was kind of able to tell if people were trying to help me or if they were just in their sort of stiff suit of like, oh, I need to say this because I'm a professional um, versus somebody who's like, oh, like, you know, this is, I can tell this is hard for you. And like, you know, maybe, this isn't the best state of mind to stay in, you know, cause you're not functional. Um, I was able to receive information more easily from somebody who like genuinely cared and genuinely like had my back, like my parents, like when they said like, Hey, like, you know, this, this or that may not be true. Or I don't know. I forget what they did. They didn't really like, they didn't really try to tell me things weren't true. They just kind of loved me. And, and if something started to be kind of weird, they would just like gently say something. And so I was more receptive to that than I was to, um, to people saying like, this is wrong or you can't be in this state. But the doctors, I was very, very resistant against them because they, it, they just seemed very stiff and very like, this is my role and this is what I need to do. It didn't come from a place of true caring and true listening, it felt like. Okay, two very small follow-up questions, Aiden. One, uh, the person who gave you the info, like the first time who gave you the information, uh, which was of this uh, manner, did yeah. you, uh, did you have hostility and anger towards that person instead of the information? Uh, did that happen? And the other question that I have is, uh, well, okay, you can answer this first. Okay. Um, not necessarily hostility it was more frustration because I, i felt like they weren't listening and they didn't understand me okay uh the other question that i have is do you think we read body language and non-verbal cues better when we are in the psychot like you may not understand what somebody's trying to say if they have a narrative and they like first of all the content is a lot and also you don't really understand what they're trying to say but do you think you read I wouldn't say body language, but you read intent uh, easily or better even. Like if somebody has, even if they're projecting to help you, but you f- feel like there's a malicious intent, like they're trying to be conniving or smart, you can, you think you have uh, in your psychotic state, you can recognize that better than in normal state? In some parts of the psychosis, yeah. Some parts for sure. Like some parts, because yeah, I felt like my senses were more open. so there was a lot more information coming in. Um, so yeah, there was the potential for that. Um, if, if I was sort of in a, in kind of an episode where I was like kind of really far out and I was sort of on my own little trip, you know, like sometimes you're like psychotic, but you're like still functional. And then you're like psychotic and you're like in an episode where you like believe your Christ and like you're having kind of like this, um, you know, this experience. Right. Uh, if I'm in that state, then I'm not really focused on like what's going on around me. It's like a very internal experience. But yeah, if I'm like functional psychosis where like I'm having some of the side effects of the psychosis, but I'm still able to kind of bridge the two worlds a little bit, then yeah, I'm much more receptive to be able to know what's going on as far as intent goes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So my biggest fear uh, after, uh, you know, the antipsychotic treatment was losing my ability to comprehend and express, especially uh, right after the antipsychotic medication when your 
uh your head is mind is a graveyard basically like no new ideas are sprouting no more you can't you don't feel emotions and uh you feel maybe i'm losing my expression capabilities and understand till the date uh, it is my biggest fear like not just in terms of psychosis in my in life i feel and it's crazy cuz i do have uh, i mean good enough expression uh, capabilities to let me through uh and just i i know that's crazy if i'm a creative person to even think that but i do I, that still is my biggest fear so uh do you have fear of losing your uh, comprehension and expression abilities because of the nature of your illness um not not necessarily um i think i think the only time i would really get scared is if i felt if i if i started using like cannabis again or if i started using uh mushrooms again then i would be scared you know i'd be really paranoid so like um because both of them were triggered by by having cannabis in my life or some kind of drug um so i feel like um as long as i i don't go towards those things that i don't think i'll have another psychosis like what i've had in the past um so that that doesn't necessarily scare me um and i feel like no matter like if i end up going into a psychosis again um eventually i'll feel like i'll, I'll normalize again you know like I'll, i'll come back i've come back both times so far okay but Yeah, as long as I'm not doing drugs, I feel like I'm I'm not too concerned about it. Okay, just as an aside, because this is also an existential research. What would you say? And I know it's a difficult question, but if you can answer, it'd be great. What is your biggest fear today, like till now? Yeah. In in life, like what's your biggest fear? Yeah. Um. and i'm being unfair i'm sorry like we don't have that on the tip of our you know it's it's a very uh, thing something you have to really consider but i right. like yeah I, yeah okay maybe we'll get back to this or maybe not you know this is no, no, something no. you don't want to share that's also cool oh it's it's good i think um i guess i guess one of my fears is to to lose my sanity and to not have it back you know um to some degree um but and then associated with that i'm also afraid of being stuck like in an institution somewhere where like um you know i i don't have any rights and i don't have any um sort of say in what's happening to me um and they have me on a bunch of medication um and then one of my other biggest fears which is unrelated to this is is being tortured that's always been something that i've been for some reason like even as like I was pretty young like I was I was always afraid of being tortured for your sins huh tortured for your sins or like tortured <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> just tortured <Yeah>. okay <laughs> I'm not I'm not worried about being tortured for my sins <laughs> I don't think that happens no cuz then like we've we've done very like i we've done the same sins right so i also need to be scared if that's the case but no <laughs> okay uh i don't really need to relay my story again so i felt a uh, an emotional detachment from my parents mm-hmm. and there is this account uh, of my mom and dad driving down to the rehab and i uh, me feeling that my dad is stupid cuz he doesn't understand what i'm trying to say and my mom she had like tears in her eyes and i could not feel uh you know she was really she was emotional but i didn't feel anything okay i i somehow justified it and i didn't feel anything so mm-hmm. uh did you feel an emotional detachment from your parents when you were in your psychosis yeah definitely i felt like i needed to like remove myself from them that i was like um 
not superior, but like I had become an adult and I was like on par with them, you know, like I didn't need them anymore and I was my own person kind of thing. Um, so yeah, separation. And I experienced the same thing with like um, my mom, like I had a hard time connecting with her like emotion because it was really hard for her. She was crying and stuff too. And I, I didn't really, um, I don't know. I, I think I was more focused on like what I was doing, what I was struggling with. So yeah, I yeah, yeah. I, I, I sort of justified it by saying, well, she's crying, but she really doesn't understand uh, that, you know, she's crying because she feels that I'm, I've become a failure. I won't be able to complete my education or look at, look how, uh, you know, his, his life is completely messed up now. And I would be like, oh, she doesn't understand that I'm actually making progress and I'm doing well. Once she knows this, she's not going to cry. She'll be joyous like me. So I, I did a lot of things to justify that and not like stay at a distance. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, I think mo- at the end of the day, it's just like not feel, being, feeling, feeling detached, I guess. So that's why I didn't go right. into the justification. But all right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, do you have siblings, Hayden? Or are you are you the only kid? I I have a younger sister. Yeah, you have a younger sister. So, uh, again, did you feel differently about your friends or your siblings? Um, well, I didn't really have like many friends that were close to me at the time. Um, I had a girlfriend, but um, I don't know. It just didn't. It didn't make it through the psychosis. I was an. Were you an asshole to your girlfriend, Aiden? Uh, yeah. I mean, looking back, I I definitely could have been nicer, especially after my psychosis. Um, yeah, yeah it was really I was, bad. Yeah, I just um, I kind of blew her off. I was just like, you know, she was trying to like be there for me and stuff, and I was just like, nah. oh man, yeah, that's another rabbit hole, man. Uh, are you on good? Are you still on good terms with your uh, ex? No. I don't I've never I haven't talked to her since I since we kind of broke up my god it's a pattern then uh, so I mean this this few things that I'm I'm sort of dying to relay so like the reason why I asked you I was an asshole to my then girlfriend uh I was really like I knew her insecurities and I'd I'd start my conversation by those insecurities okay I'd pinch her where it hurts and uh you know, I, I remember this one day, I, so I was doing ketamine, right? And uh, you become like a robot and you can't function. And on my birthday, this is my birthday, okay? And I've I've called my friends over and then I've, I've been like, okay, fuck off. I'm drunk. I'm like, fuck off. I don't need you. My girlfriend stays. All of you, fuck off. Okay. And I was, I tried to be bossy. I, I wasn't bossy, but I was like, give me this one day where I can be bossy. And then I did ketamine. And she took off my clothes. She gave me a nice bath. She combed my hair and she put me to sleep that day. And I, I, st- I still, you know, I would go around and calling, like telling my friends, she's a bitch, man. She doesn't, she's dumb. She's, she's a dumb bimbo, you know. I just, I got into her because I was attracted to her. And now, I mean, now that's not even the only thing that was keeping it together. Now I'm not even attracted to her. So like, I don't know why I'm, even in this relationship and I was really bad to her. So a uh, cut to four years later, I mean, I'm, uh, we made promise, you know, uh, like it's, we made promises of life ahead and a marriage and all of that, okay, which is lame, but I mean, I didn't do it. I just said yes, because I needed something, you know, she was a means to what I need. But, uh, four years later, I, I called her up. She she made a German boyfriend after that. She didn't go for an Indian guy, you know, which is because I had spoiled that image for her. So uh, I called her up four years later and I was like, listen, uh, I was a joke to you. And I'm really so like, I have to give closure to this. I am not, I was not in my senses. It's not like I'm that a bad guy. It's just like, I don't know what I was doing. And I didn't know I had hurt somebody so badly and all of that. She still hasn't recovered from that. So she abused me. And uh, right before cutting the call, she was like, if this call is getting recorded and this person like commits suicide or whatever, I mean, she was melodramatic. She thought I- I'm committing suicide. So I'm saying sorry to everyone. What should I, I am not responsible. And she cut the call. I was like, finally, I got in my stories. And yeah, I mean, that's, that was bad. I, nobody, 
who doesn't understand what we're going through should be that close and always around because they are going to be at the like receiving end of all our bullshit you know mm-hmm. so, yeah did you get a chance to uh, get closure on it or like understand from her perspective what did she see and you like okay it's it's fine it's okay she's moved on no i mean i don't i don't really feel the need to i mean it it is it is what it is like yeah i mean i think i think you know it's like yeah i wasn't a great person like to her in that moment um but i don't know it's like it kind of helps you know she she is a very superficial person still so even if i didn't say sorry it wouldn't have mattered i did for me i still don't respect her as a person to till today <laughs> even yeah. even though i know i was bad to her I, if i was it i would respect them for who they are like they, they didn't they don't take their life seriously you know people, anyone who like squanders away this life by not doing something meaningful i just don't i can't see myself to respect them yeah right. so that is also there anyway we are staying away and i've again opened my filthy mouth so moving on listen were you uh, were you always thin or did you have uh, drastic changes in your uh, body image were you fat before or nothing like that no i got i lost a lot of weight bef- like during my psychosis though like during both of them like preceding them i i lost a lot of weight and then i put the weight back on but like i weigh like 150 right now 150 150 pounds and okay. i was 100 i was for both of my psychosis i was um i was at 135 so i was like 15 pounds lighter yeah okay i'll have to convert that to understand but i, I can think convert that's... it here uh so i was 68 at first that's my normal weight and i went down to 61 oh, okay no oh, 7 kg okay yeah uh okay i'll i'll tell you my uh, my weight right now can you uh, convert 100 kg to pounds yeah Yeah. 100 is 220 pounds. Okay, I'm 220 pounds. <laughs> how tall how tall are you? <laughs> I'm uh 5'8", I guess. Oh wow. <laughs> I'm fat, man. I'm fat. It doesn't like the camera does a really good work of hiding it, but I'm really I'm ridiculously fat. Uh okay, so did your body image ever uh, affect your physical or mental well-being ever? Like were you ever worried about your weight or it wasn't something that really bothered you it didn't it no. might like yeah makes no sense okay uh you've done this you've done this you've done this okay this is a very difficult question to explain but okay have we discussed this uh, us not being confrontational in our psychosis and uh, imitating people have we discussed this before i don't think so Okay so uh, in my psychosis uh, there were people who say like the bully that i was living with i guess i've told this about myself to you so he was he was bullying me and he wasn't good to me so i wouldn't confront him and say dude this is not done and this is not cool the way you treat me instead i would uh, demonstrate his behavior i would imitate him and then when they would be disgusted or they'd be like this is not cool uh, i'd be like Oh, so now you understand how I felt, and I still won't tell them. This is the reason why I'm doing it. Basically, I would just imitate behaviors I did not like to the people I did not like their behavior of. So, did you do something similar, like indirect ways of showing people what you didn't like about them in the, you know psychosis? Yeah, I remember my girlfriend was in the hospital with me, um, and I was in my hospital bed. This was like one of the early phases of my psychosis. Um, and she was trying to control me she's like hey don't stop it you have to stop it and so i was like stop it stop it you have to stop right <laughs> and uh so i was basically reflecting back to her like what she was trying to do because i saw that like 
it was her own insecurities. And so I was reflecting it back. Um, and I, I forgot what I said, but um, I don't know. I, I said something and everybody laughed, but it kind of like reflected back to her, like what, you know, what she was doing. Um, yes, yeah, still hilarious, by the way. <laughs> still holds up, you know. <laughs> uh, yes, okay. So I, I had a similar experience, yeah. All right. Okay, so I, I uh, I'm going to introduce a, a technical jargon and I'm going to explain what it is. Uh, are you aware of ideas of reference and delusions of reference? These two ideas? Mm-hmm. Okay. So when someone believes that their thoughts, actions or presence has caused something to occur, these thoughts are called ideas of reference. And when, uh, say you're walking in the marketplace and somebody is saying something and you hear your name. So delusions of reference is you hearing some a stranger talking about you by mentioning your name. So ideas of reference, my thoughts are causing things to happen and delusions of reference, people are talking about me. Did, did you go through these uh, two symptoms in your psychosis? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it kind of ties into like synchronicity where like I would show up and like one thing would happen and it's like, how could this have happened? Because like, I just had a bunch of other things that happened that like, led to this that also like mean that has meaning and it was like i mean even now when i think back on it, i'm like how the heck did that happen like it's like what i don't understand you try to um, explain it in retrospect like oh this is what might have happened like this is how it is mundane and boring and not revelationary like i thought it was do you do that yeah i, I mean that's the whole process of me recovering from psychosis is me figuring out like what was real and what was just me to being delusional um but part of part, some of them were like this like this is some crazy shit that happened like legit like how i don't understand like how you know like i'll say something to someone and they'll understand what i meant and it was a complete metaphor and they'll respond in a way that like i don't know like sometimes it, it just doesn't make sense but i'm just like okay well i guess that's what happened um and then thinking, like hearing people, I, I, it was mostly that I heard things on the radio that I thought were being spoken to me uh, specifically. That was what, um, like thoughts of reference, I guess. Um, right. Ideas of reference or whatever. De- that, del- delusions of reference. De- delusions of reference, yeah. That, that was the radio mostly. And then things happening around me that were also like speaking to me, you know. Um, yeah was a common experience can you can you give an example of something ridiculous like a ridiculous example of synchronicity where i i still can't explain this like one or two maybe i'm trying to think um okay yeah so there's one uh there's one thing so i and this this is my second psychosis so i end up in the hospital for some reason like this is crazy. So uh, there's a sequence of events. So I don't know, my, my parents are bringing me somewhere and I don't know where they're taking me. But what I do is I, I, I clean my bed out, I clean my closet out, like I clean everything. I don't know why I just feel like that's what I need to do. I like clean my bed and take my sheets off and stuff. And, and then like, um, you know, they bring me to the hospital and it turns out that they're bringing me to like stay in a psych ward. And so then I told them, you see, like, part of me knew that you were going to leave me here. Like, I, I knew before that they were going to bring me there that, like, they were they were going to leave me. Because I why would I, like, undo my whole bed? It doesn't make sense. And then, so I get to the hospital. Before I left the house, though, I, I, brought, um, I brought a book with me. I brought the Bhagavad Gita with me. Um, and so I was like, this is an important book that I need with me right now. So I brought it with me. And I get to the hospital and um, I'm there for like a couple days. And then I, I wake up in the morning, I come out and there's this Indian guy there. And I'm like, I look out, the, I, look at, I look at him, I'm like, oh, I look at him and said, welcome to the team. I just like, I don't know why I said it, but he's like, oh my God, he got me went nuts. He's like, welcome to the team. 
crazy. He was crazy. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> so his name was Sadash. He was a character. Uh, he thought he was Krishna. He's like, welcome to the team. Do, 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 do. He's like playing a tr- like playing a little trumpet and stuff. Uh, and uh, so I came out. I was like, oh shit! Like he he knows what's up. Like we're on the same page. Like we're here to wake up the whole world. You know. Oh, so was he was he a doctor? Or was he a male nurse? Or was he like another psychotic person? Another psychotic person. <laughs> So, so I go out and I bring him the Bhagavad Gita and I'm like, look what I brought with me. He's like, man, this is this is a sacred text. I'm like, yeah, man. Yeah, that's why I brought it. And he's like, oh, my God, you are blessed. You are blessed. This is amazing. Oh, shit, man. It was hilarious. So we just, it was like, it was crazy. Like, why would I like, you know, like it could just be coincidence, but like, why did I like feel like I was compelled to bring the Bhagavad Gita? And then like, why did I meet him? And then like, we kind of had like a uh, continued friendship afterwards. Um, and so I, I learned a lot working with him, but he, um, he ended up going back into a psychosis afterwards. So I kind of had to help him through that. Um, and he ended up going back to India because his, um, you know, he struggled with this for a while, but um, his his family was in India. So like he wanted to be, his parents wanted him to be with his family and he needed to be with his family to kind of deal with, um, with all that stuff. Um, Cause he didn't, he didn't have any support here. I was his only support. And I'm like, I can support you to a certain degree, but I'm not like your guy, you know, like I've got my own stuff. Yeah. Um, so that was one of them. Um, but yeah. just like, yeah. um, I'll tell you one more real quick. Um, when I, my first psychosis, the first thing I did, I went to my parents' house and I gave them both gifts um, to like, to I don't know. I don't know why I gave them gifts, but I gave them like, I gave um, my mom, Georgie, which is, um, I actually have him here. This is Georgie. I've had him since okay. I was, since I was born. The day I was born, I was given Georgie. So he's like very sentimental to me like I've I've brought him everywhere with me like I used to sleep with him all the time but now he just like sits on my desk um but he's very sentimental and he's sort of like an emotional support so I gave Georgie to my mom and then I gave a little um it, it was a little piece of artwork that I made when I was a kid it was like a butterfly and a heart on it and I gave that to my dad um and I said you know I don't know what I said to them, but I'm like, you guys will need these, you know, these will be important for you. And I, 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 I don't know if I explained, but I, I just said, these, you're going to need these things. So I like gave both of them a hug and then I left. And then the next time I saw them, I was in the hospital. So like part of me knew that like I was going to be gone and I was going on a journey and that, you know, it would take me a while to come back and that it was going to be hard for them. You know, like what would compel me to to do that? Um, yeah. You know, those kind of things were like it was kind of like premonition, but like without me knowing, just kind of doing, just impulse. So those those were, I think I guess those were just a couple examples, but there were others too. Yeah. <clears throat> a few of them hilarious, few of them really uh, sentimental. Uh, but yeah, I like, yeah, I mean these these are common you know and the things that we still can't explain uh yeah. bringing which brings us to another like it's it's not part of the questionnaire but this is something that i have dealt with and uh i don't have an answer to this maybe you have uh it's about it's it's about destiny and the, us taking preemptive action you know so what what has happened is in my psychosis i have done things that I don't really know why I'm doing this. Okay. And later on, I, when I needed something, it, the, the thing that I did before sort of came in handy. Like, for example, I'd, I'd hide matchsticks in, in my shaving kit sometimes, you know, just two or three. And then, you know, when I'm on my second joint, I'd run out of, all lighters, all mastics, everyone's asleep because it's very late. I'm like, God, I don't have, how would I light this joint? And then I remember that in my shaving kit, there are three matchsticks and yeah. they come in handy. And when I was doing it, I, I, didn't, I didn't know why I was putting there. 
put in the match sticks yeah. in a shaving kit makes no sense right right so there's a lot of i feel i took a lot of preemptive in both states okay even in non psychotic and psychotic states in psychotic state i took a lot of preemptive decisions even in terms of changing my behavior and doing certain things that when i was sober when i came out of it uh, helped me and there were a lot of organization uh, skills like things that i was doing you know keeping my books aside keeping the, the bong here putting the stash here and uh, folding a page on a certain thing so that when i pick it up i open that page and all of that i would without thinking in my sober state i'd do and then when i'm well when i'm psychotic uh i i would find those things right there and it, my whole experience was sort of orchestrated by the other person or me before i was psychotic so mm-hmm. do you i i don't know if i believe in destiny but i do feel a lot of the things are i do are preemptive and i only don't know like it's it's destined but i am only doing i am making choices but i don't know like how are they going to come in handy later so what what are your thoughts about destiny and you know the things that you just said like there were things you couldn't explain packing and then you actually had to go and you didn't at even at that point you didn't question well, why was i packing and how does it fit so nicely or like of course and <laughs> you just moved on right so what are your thoughts about destiny now and about this preemptive and preordained business um that's something that i thought about a lot um i think more than likely it, it's not i don't think everything is necessarily um predetermined i think in some ways like I think in some ways everything is predetermined but it's also not predetermined. Like it's predetermined because I think on the grand scheme of things time doesn't really exist so like this is all already happened. But on the other sense that like it's not already set in stone is because we have choices. So um we have choices in the present moment um and those unfold over time but since time doesn't really exist on the other dimension um or some other dimensions um especially ones like from creative from creation um it i think it it are, is already happened you know it's already has unfolded um and so it's kind of this this dance between like um being in the unfolding and then and then going back to where it unfolded from which is it's already been resolved so like there's sort of the resolution on this side and then there's the unfolding on the other side and they both kind of like are part, like create each other because like without the whole without the whole experience happening the whole resolution can't happen but the resolution has already happened because this is already happened does that make sense yes it does weirdly it does make sense so but like i would know how to explain it to somebody else so like those synchronicities and stuff like that it's because like it it's just because I think we're closer to the the state of of being timeless and connected to to a place where things are just they just it's happened, you know. And so you start to notice some of the things that like are they're just happening because you're already in that space, you already kind of know what's going to happen, you know. Um and so part of you acts on that. Um but you know, I think I think probably when when people meditate a lot like when they have a lot of experience meditating um or a lot of mindfulness practice they they probably come to a point where they're living their life and and yes on some level they're they're making choices but on another level they're probably just watching themselves live their life like they're they're observing think on things unfolding so they're they're not necessarily like Oh I really like wonder like you know what I'm going to eat for breakfast like they just listen to their body and then they eat breakfast you know it's not so much of like a compulsive mind place um it's more of like an observing of unfolding because that's really what meditation is like yeah. you just notice like oh there's a thought oh there's a thought there's a thought and as you go deeper and deeper into that you probably realize that existence is literally just like oh there's this there's that there's this so you just kind of like 
watching and allowing things to happen and you just kind of move through life wherever like wherever it kind of takes you you know and you're not worried about like what's going to be happening or what has happened you're just in the moment and that's like when synchronicities and when understanding and things like that happens because like you're just part of the flow at that point you're not resisting the flow you're not afraid of the flow it just is you know it's kind of like um people who aren't at that state are kind of in a river you know and it, it bounces you around or whatever and you fall out of your boat and you get back in your boat and but somebody who's meditated a long time and had a lot of practice and experience they they follow the stream they know sort of how the river goes and when you practice enough you kind of become part of the river because you aren't afraid of anything you're not resisting anything and so you become one with that river and there's you know there's nothing to to fight against i guess you know uh, <clears throat> yeah like again in med i mean i'm just trying to understand uh, it more clearly in 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 meditation so like there are two two ways to meditate and i only talk about the one way which you were talking about is you don't engage with the thoughts and you sit and observe the thoughts right and mm-hmm. that's what you're also saying about uh <clears throat> the people who practice this organically a lot like they're sort of watching their own selves uh unfold in uh you know play out in the world but they're not engaging with it and they're like not concerned because uh they're at peace because of the practice that they're doing in their meditation and that's what they're applying to other domains of their life right mm-hmm. yeah and it's yeah, not that they're like it's not that they're like removing themselves from your life or it's not like they're like unemotional or detached right. it's that they're like they're aware of of the patterns and the trends that happen within the mind and the body and and they're so comfortable with them that nothing really like nothing really triggers them you know because yeah. like some a person who hasn't practiced a lot might get irritated with the practice and they'll get up and and walk away someone who has a lot of experience will sit with the irritation and just notice it and be like oh that's i'm irritated right now that's interesting okay yeah and then they they come to learn and understand it and in that way they 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 kind of move past it because it's no longer a resistance it's they just realize it's that's just part of me you know that's that's something that is within me already you know yeah. i mean when you try to explain it it's uh being detached from your body and what we are talking about uh, in terms of explanation they're very similar but in terms of approaches they're almost diametrically opposite approaches towards life you know like being detached from yourself and just not uh you know like not being emotional and all of that is completely different from what you were, were talking about right yeah it's the opposite and it's yeah it's, it's very harmful yes, i think that's yes. what leads to the people who are psychopaths and things like that yes yes they yes. suppress so much that they don't feel anymore but it's causing major issues where they like feel okay with killing people because they don't feel things you know say it say it yeah yeah that's it's wonderfully put man yeah all right uh moving on to the next question Okay, are you aware of inner speech hidden? I think I didn't mention it, but I didn't explain what it is. Um, well, go ahead and explain it. Okay, so it's a scientific term. Wait, why has your my... microphone switched? Is it back to this one? No, it's not back to that one. It sounds like a laptop microphone or something. <laughs> okay. Okay, maybe it's back. There we go. We're back. Okay. Yeah. So inner speech uh is is a scientific term we use for let's we're just talking about people who don't hear voices. Uh when you read a book the the voice that is narrating the book is called subvocalizing and that's your inner speech. When you're thinking about something that's your inner speech, right? So uh that is regular inner speech and everybody has that. Which is the voice uh that is your our own voice that helps us think or read a book yes we've gone through this how is your inner speech different from the voices you hear and how do you distinguish between the two i didn't hear any voices right i just heard i just like i had i had my thoughts and i believed them as truth 
Okay, so it was all of it was in a speech for you then. Okay. Yeah, it was in a speech. I mean, I guess like it could be interpreted as voices, but I never saw them as as something external. Like I would feel things. It's kind of like um it's kind of like when I do card readings for people and stuff like that, like I would feel something and that would be associated with a thought. And so then it would be like, okay, that's that's something that I'm experiencing right now. So like um you know, I would like think that I'm Christ but I would also like feel that I had like divinity within me or like I felt like a connection or something would synchronize like while it was happening so I would like I had several times where I was like oh my gosh I'm Christ and then something outside in the world like literally showed up at that exact moment to confirm that that was true so like in the hospital um, I know I'm going off subject, but I think you'll find it interesting. Um, in the hospital, like I was going through one of my psychotic episodes where I was like in, in a, you know, an, an intense, like, I don't like calling delusions, but it was like sort of down the rabbit hole kind of thing. And I remember, I don't know, I, I don't know if I was being dragged, but it felt uh, like in my memory, I was like being dragged somewhere. Um, and as I was dragging by the TV, the TV literally had a song about Christ on it. And I'd been there for like a week and a half and I'd never seen anything on that TV that had Christ on it because it was monitored by the, the, the people there. Right. And so, um, you know, they, they wouldn't let people put certain things on TV. I'd never seen something about Christ on there. And it was in that, in that episode that I believed that I was Christ in that moment. And I saw it on the TV and I was like, oh my gosh, that's like confirmation, you know? So that's kind of like where the thoughts were. It was like a thought associated with like an external stimuli or a thought uh, accompanied with like a feeling inside, you know? Right. Okay. Well, I, I was, I, I admit, I was a little distracted because of this one, but I did. Uh, I forgot my question. I was listening to you keenly, but I forgot what's this in response to and the, the, the question was um about inner speech and if i what's the difference right so you speech? you it, it came from the inside the thought but the confirmations you got from the outside so it wasn't like that was the initiation uh, and it was basically from the inside the inner speech yeah yeah okay mm -hmm. uh all right moving on Misleading media representations don't just worsen the problem of stigma. They also negatively affect voice hearers own understanding of their experiences and themselves. Can you think of bad representations of psychotic individuals in movies or a TV series or print media? And has it affected you in your personal life? Well, hmm. I think there's there's like stories about it. Like I just watched a movie recently with um with my girlfriend and her brother, and um, it was called Run. Um, it's basically about this mother who has basically a postpartum psychosis after she loses her baby to premature childbirth. So she ends up stealing a baby. Um, from the hospital and raising that child as her own, but giving her, basically poisoning her so she would have the same disabilities as what the premature baby would have had, had it survived. Um, and then basically the, the plot of the story is that the child figures out and, you know, a bunch of crazy shit happens, but I won't ruin it for you. But like from, from, from what I've been through, I, I can understand why the mother would do that um, based on how traumatic that would must have been for her to lose her, her child. Um, but the thing is like, I don't think a lot of people would necessarily take that approach. And so I think there's a lot of movies like that where there's like movies about people who have had psychoses or delusions or like extreme personality um, defects um, and stuff like that, but they don't necessarily like talk about the story of the person and sort of how that happened and um you know give their side usually like people who are viewed as crazy or viewed as criminals are viewed only as that you know they don't dig any further they don't try to understand 
that person's side of the story. Um, I, I always tell people that I think criminals are probably one of the most underserved populations in the whole world. Um, That's good. Because, because um, a lot of them are dealing with severe trauma, severe issues that they don't know how to handle. And so, you know, they have, I'm not saying that like, <laughs> there's definitely some of them that don't want to heal. And that's a different story. Like if somebody is a murderer and they're not willing to work on themselves, um, you know, there's not much more than you can do that you can do other than keep them in a place so they're not going to hurt people. You know, um, everybody's responsible for their own healing, but there's definitely not resources available in most places where people can get the help they need and get support. Um, I think just because somebody's done something once in their life doesn't mean that they can't have a second chance at like back back at life. And sometimes when someone does something, like someone gets murdered, um, like I could totally see how someone could murder someone in a psychotic state, totally. Because if you believe that killing that person's gonna save the world, they're gonna do it, you know? And they're not doing it because they, they're mad or they're angry at that person. They're doing it because that's what their mind, that's what the voices are telling them to do. Um, does that make them a criminal? I don't think so. Does it mean that they need to be supervised and make supervised and make sure that doesn't happen again? Definitely, you know. So like, there's a difference between criminality and and um, and like just they need help, you know. And so I, I think I think our structure and our society needs to first of all investigate more like what is actually happening instead of just being like wow this is really intense and scary and like you know like that was crazy this person's crazy it's like okay well still a person you know yeah. like there's still a story behind that um so yeah i guess that's my my rant <laughs> No, no. I mean, you you made quite a lot of sense. I mean, uh, I don't want to bore you with my social work, like history and what I've worked with, but I was, uh, for for a year, I was working with juvenile criminals. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my particular context, it's, uh, they're driven to uh, criminal behavior. So because they come from low socioeconomic backgrounds right. and uh, very desperate households, father's an alcoholic, and she's seen domestic abuse, like you can't, the reason why I can't imagine domestic abuse is because I haven't seen it in my house. But if you see it, you can imagine even graver abuse after that, right? And if you are put in a situation where if you don't do it, you're not going to have a meal the next day. Uh, so basically, they're driven to it. And there's also, I guess, from a particular religion and a particular community aspect to it, because we haven't, as a nation, like put a lot of attention onto them and they've been like in terms of resources they don't so yeah i mean the, the when you say that uh the people who've committed the crime are sort of not it's not their identity to just they're not criminals it's they've done something criminal but they're also people uh, and most in most cases like in my context they're driven to it they have no other option they're desperate so yeah i, mean, so I think yeah, I agree. I think there's also exceptions where there's like people who know they're doing something wrong and they still yeah, yeah, they are psychopaths, man. Psycho nobody is like contesting that. I mean, psychopaths, uh, they're fucking, uh, you know, they're seductive almost. I, I saw a few documentaries where I, I'm so enamored by the psychopath that I'm not, I'm, I'm ready to forget that he has killed 30 people. I'm just... You know, I just love the way he's expressing his ideas and all that. So they they have a biological predisposition almost to just do that. I mean, it's it's in their genes sometimes, you know. So they don't feel like they've actually been brain scans where you show them a picture of, a, you know, a poor person sort of bleeding or a mother crying and she's put torn clothes in. And there are regions in the brain that light up that, you know, uh, show compassion or you know empathy and in terms of psychopaths they nothing lights up so they're not their brains are not telling them this is something you should be worried about so you can actually go and, uh, kill them or whatever you don't have to relate to them so it's not I mean it's not their fault but again you have to you know keep them away from the society if that's the case there's boundaries there's boundaries because the biggest thing is keeping people safe yeah but like I think 
keeping people safe is like important, but then we also need to remember that like some of these people are also not safe. Like they've experienced things that were not safe. And so we also need to turn the tables to the other side and be like, yeah, a lot of the time, a lot of the time somebody who's been molested as a child becomes a child molester, you know? Right. Like, so yeah, I mean, it's a cycle, man. It's a, it's a, it's a vicious cycle. It'll keep happening until we deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, have we talked about thought broadcasting before? I think we have twice before this. We talked about it a little bit, but we didn't go. As, we, you asked me if I had it, and that was the extent of it, I think. Yeah. So uh, this this is, uh, I mean, we're going to discuss this in detail. So did you experience thought broadcasting? I'll answer this for you. Yes. Did you get frustrated because you believed everyone else could hear your thoughts but are pretending they can't actually hear them. In what ways did you tackle this situation? And of course, you can give a detailed account of a thought broadcasting episode too. Um, I don't think, I don't think I got frustrated. I think that people, some people knew, like I thought that some people knew, like what was going on to me. It wasn't so much thought broadcasting as it was like state broadcasting so I, I i thought people knew where i was in my journey and i knew that people knew like what where i was yeah where i was i guess you know so that includes thoughts that includes like feelings and that includes, includes the storyline of what i was in right. um but um I'm trying to think of a time where i got frustrated um was it like the most yeah was it like the most harrowing part of your experience that my privacy is gone and everybody can like knows uh my journey or my state like i'm i can't do this in the privacy of my own comfort and all of that or it was not never happened that never happened for me for me i was like i was comfortable um if everybody knew that was fine if nobody knew that was fine i mean my, my goal was to share my experience, to share knowledge and share understanding. Um, I didn't want to like keep it hidden necessarily. I was pretty neutral about that. Um, but I, I guess like there were some secrets that I was like keeping or like keep it secrets that I was holding in, I guess. Um, but, you know, if somebody like yeah, I guess there was stuff that I wanted to keep secret, but nobody figured out the secrets, so it was okay. Uh, were there different personalities? Uh, so again, somebody who's guarding the secret, somebody who's putting on a face. Uh, were there different personalities within you, or uh, and did like one exploit the other, or was it like a uniform personality thing? Just uniform. It was uniform. just. It was. It wasn't personalities. It was more like just fluidness. Like, you know, if I was sad, I was sad. If I was happy, I was happy. You know, if I was, you know, explaining something to someone, it was. It was all connected. It was just, you know, it's like the river analogy. Like some parts of the river were fast and furious, and other parts were kind of tranquil and calm. It's. It's still the river. It's just a different part of it. Yeah. are there okay i i don't think i should ask this question it's going to bring up something which i like for me the moment i read it it brought up i don't want to uh, let's not go into this question stupid question anyway okay uh right i think we've discussed this before i'll just read it uh hayden i think we've discussed this if you have just uh, you can ask me to move on to the next question okay uh so Dutch psychiatrist Marius Rom claims uh, that voices are messengers communicating important information about unresolved emotional problems. Do you think your voices have significance uh, that they point to underlying psychological problems? Um, well, I didn't have voices, but um, I think that most likely the voices or the experience is an unfolding of some of the things that I have yet to process or yet to integrate. So like, I'll give you an example, like the feeling of wholeness, the feeling of like connection to source and stuff like that. That was something that I didn't 
that I, I hadn't connected to before my experience. And that was something that I struggled with um, trying to find. Like it felt familiar. It felt like something that like, that just, you know, when I first like, read the Bhagavad Gita, I was like, this makes sense. Like, I, I understand what they're talking about and I want to learn about this more. Like it immediately, I just lit up. So like having that sort of connection experience, like during my psychosis was like, you know, that was part of myself that I like wanted to, to integrate eventually, you know, over time. Um, I think it like happened quicker than like what I wanted it to, you know, and it, it didn't happen in the natural way. Uh, well, I guess psychosis in some ways is natural, but it's not like a recommended experience. Yeah. Um, and so like now I feel like I, I have that connection. I understand that connection better. So it's almost like I had a glimpse of like what where I was going in the future, sort of like we we're talking about like the the destiny thing, you know, like yeah. where you're headed. I think most likely parts and pieces of ourself that we sort of repress and maybe like are it's shielded behind a wall of our thoughts and sort of structures that we create for ourselves that comes out in psychosis. So if if we're like very um loving people who like love to like share and like give and stuff like that some of that will show up in the psychosis um if you're somebody who like is spiritual in some way and like wants to connect like wants to have that feeling of connection and stuff like that that will probably show up which i think pretty much everybody who has the psychosis feels those things but i've i've heard of psychosis experiences that were like exclusively very scary and based completely on paranoia so i think that like definitely a lot of the things that are in the subconscious or some of the stuff that's suppressed is going to come out because the rational mind isn't as active so a lot of the emotional stuff a lot of the the issues that we've suppressed are going to come up in that state for sure so i i agree with that this is okay this is a very uh this is a weird question but this happened to me that's what i'm asking you there were times when i came i had come out of the psychosis and i'm i'm functioning normally and in my dream i i sort of revisit me being psychotic and i have like a whole episode run out and i get mm-hmm. up and i'm like oh shit i'm missing out on all the action or something and then five minutes after that i'm like oh, you know nothing like that but like your dream is sort of bringing out again those repressed uh maybe it's just playing with those repressed memories because it's sometimes it's a new thing and it's not really a reproduction of something that has happened from memory but it's it's a very int- the dream sort of when you wake up you're scared you're like oh shit i'm am i psychotic or oh, i'm not psychotic again thank god mm-hmm. that that has happened to me i think f- four or five times has it happened to you yeah i've had a dream where i was psychotic in the dream and then i woke up and i was like well that's good and then i'm like because <laughs> i was getting worried like towards the end of the dream i'm like shit like this, this is not good like i i can't be in the state like this is not helpful yeah, um, yeah. or like i'll have dreams where like i start smoking pot or something and then i get paranoid that i'm going to go psychotic or something yeah. um in the dream stuff like that yeah yeah by the way i mean you're you're lucky that you know you can i mean uh you can smoke hemp and you can smoke cb only C- uh, weed that has cbd because mm-hmm. here the market is really unregulated and it's illegal to mm-hmm. so, like weed is not legal anywhere mm-hmm. in any state so even though it grows like naturally yeah, yeah it grows naturally yeah. yeah you can you can take you can hand rub you can sort of make it on your own but it's illegal and yeah. uh because of that so they don't check the strains for how much cbd content and how much thc it is if if you make it legal it becomes more organized and you have testing and it's right. safer almost to you know be a pothead but yeah um, it's not and therefore i don't have even if i want the relaxing calming even anti psychotic as you were discussing last time properties of cbd i can't get like access. even products like cbd oil you know uh, we not none of that that's weird yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i think like my opinion we need to legalize all drugs regulate it make sure it's safe and yeah. then all the money that goes into the drugs invested into recovery centers for people who are addicted to drugs so then they have resources available to help them or or research make- man or research because you don't 
maybe yeah. some of them don't even need to be recovered you know like they're they're going yeah. they're taking a journey which is going to help a lot of other people like humanity even like our most craziest grandiose delusions it might happen that somebody who's doing a lot of you know the psychonaut stuff can come up with like a almost a real revelation and can actually change the way we are involved in such like small and little things you know like a spiritual guru almost of sorts and take yeah. away our cynicism you know there's a lot of cynicism that's why uh you know spiritual there's so many people who just shun it without even like getting into it first you know like i'm saying you you want to shun it you shun it but at least read about it first you know get into it first yeah, yeah. i'm talking more about like drugs like methamphetamines heroin yeah like oh yeah yeah they're not they're mm-hmm. not for sure. i mean they're just they're just to lie down and just yeah leave it yeah. you're not you're not going to learn a lot other than yeah. like not conducive it, to introspection yeah yeah so like those are the ones i mean those are the ones that like most people will be against legalizing but those are the ones especially that need to be legalized so then like people have they don't feel afraid to come out and get help from them you know i think i honestly i think all drugs should be legal and just like like you said research and then treatment facilities where people can go back and get like free treatment you know not not paying just like allow them to go which I, I still don't know why our country doesn't have free health care to me it's ridiculous but yeah you know it 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 baffles me but employment opportunities so man employment like there, there's so many people who've gone so further down the line like eight years into drug addiction they don't know who they are anymore they don't have a stable job they don't have fa- cut off from the family and just if eight years he's just been doing cocaine imagine if if it's all regulated and they're like oh we need experts on cocaine now like we need people who have done long term you know it's almost like research like who've done long term study of this substance for eight years what are the effects okay how what was it like initially i mean they they're experts man they can tell you well, this is what happened and this is what i did like how i am like you are also an expert of your experience you know like that and uh, just think of the employment they're all researchers in their own right you know if we make it legal and we actually don't hush it on the carpet and things like that so yeah, yeah. I mean, it's crazy man the world fucking crazy you know <laughs> and i'm not cynical but yeah, sometimes i feel yeah. like yeah well there's a lot of pain and oppression that's happened in our history and so it's it's a matter of um you know learning to look at that and and accept that and work with it instead of just pushing it away which is what making drugs illegal are and what putting people away in jail is basically you know i i think there's still there's some people that need to be put away because like they're not going to improve they're not going to work on themselves and they're just going to do the same thing and they're not willing to look and be like hey like maybe i do need to change you know so that's it's it's not there's never a perfect system but there's always ways to make it better you know yeah yeah all right uh man i'm i'm okay i'm going to reveal this when we finish this what's the time we have 20 minutes right mm-hmm. okay this is a rapid fire then we have five questions and okay. we'll just i mean you just have to answer the questions and i won't say anything okay yeah i mean if you can condense it it's yeah. been great but i don't i won't recommend that cuz we don't also we need rich data also okay right. do you think our way of living our lifestyle our world view has something to offer to the with the air quotes normal people do you think you would choose a normal life if you had been given the option without ever having a psychotic episode is is the connotation so do you think the, the question is do i think the world view from a, from psychos from a psychotic perspective has benefit to the to general normal people basically our experience do they have something do we have something to offer to somebody who has no psychosis and never been through that to the normal people our way of living our lifestyle our world view do we have something to offer to these people and uh, do you think you would choose a life without any psychosis uh, if you were given an option uh yes and and no so yes it is helpful because all the stuff that i was able to go through and the stuff that i experienced makes me much more able to empathize 
and help other people who are going through not psychosis necessarily like yes psychosis but also all kinds of other um, like mental health issues um, because I've literally been in not all of them but a lot of those places I've probably been before um, and so that makes me a very capable person to be able to to sort of understand where that person's at and work with them I'm, I'm obviously like there's some places that I haven't been before, so there's some places that I can't um, help with, but uh, it increases my breadth of experience. Um, it increases my breadth of, of um, you know, of fear, of anxiety, of depression, all those things, very deep. So I'm, I'm able to work with people who, have, who are in those things. Um, as far as living life without, like living a normal life, no, I wouldn't because uh, this is who I am, you know, I'm not ashamed or I'm, I'm, I don't regret my experience. Um, it's, it's part of me and like the things that I know and the things I understand are because of the experiences I've gone through. So to trade them out would basically say that I, I regret having them or I'm ashamed of, or it's been too hard for me, which yes, it was hard, but I was able to get through it. I think for some people it is too hard for them. And so they wish they didn't have it because it, it messed up their life, you know, and I, I don't blame them for that, you know, like, I think for some people, it is really hard. Um, and um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, next question, Aiden. Uh, do you feel, ca okay, do you feel caregivers get hung up on what is real and what is not real according to them and the society? Do you think it's a st how how has the question be framed okay uh, wait i will i will reframe the question basically uh, our caregivers they relate our delusions to intelligence and uh, i mean that this person is not thinking coherently intelligently uh, and i mean you do even even people who are in the psychotic state you do sort of see it as a sign of intelligence do you think it's justified to say that well, he's crazy, so he's not, you know, not coherent or incoherent, just like getting dumber or, you know, it's, it's a sign of, does intelligence have anything to do with it is my question. Delusions and... No, I don't think, I don't think it has to do with intelligence. Yeah, yeah I don't um, think, I don't think this question makes sense, Aiden. Let's just move on. We anyway are running short of time. Yeah, okay. I don't know what the question is trying to ask. <laughs> I was trying to explain something I don't understand myself. Okay. Uh, can you list all the nice things about being a psychotic person? Things that a normal person might be missing out on? How do you contrast the two lifestyles? And anyway, we have done this. I think this is the same question uh, worded differently. Moving on. Okay. Do you feel there are no avenues to discover the real self in the real world for the normal people? The idea, the assumption being that we, uh, psychosis helped us you know, we, like we were talking about earlier, that it unleashes more of what we are. It helps us uncover our real selves. Uh, do you think for normal people, the avenues in the real world to discover their real selves are not there? Um, I don't think that it's that they're not there. Um, I think it's just, uh, there's been a lot of misinformation. I think we, we all have the tools to be able to like understand ourselves better. Um, it's just a matter of like, we're told, we're, we're kind of misled. We're told that doing certain things are going to help us understand ourselves better and make us happy. But usually the opposite is true is if we pursue those things, they're gonna make us not happy. Um, and they're, they're gonna help us, they're gonna make us you know, less understanding of ourselves. So, because if you think about things like um, toxic masculinity and stuff like that, of like, you have to be a man and like, that's the way to do it, you know, or, um, you know, you have to be a girl and that's the way to do it. You like, you have to like pink, you have to like blue, like those kinds of things, like those programming, that conditioning basically prevents you from connecting with yourself and, and, you know, realizing what you truly like because of what the roles or what's expected of you, or even like saying that like a man and a woman are the ones that should be together. That's like very damaging for someone who's homosexual, you know, like, like that is talk about like covering up like self discovery and self understanding of who you are. 
like that's that's pretty fucking damaging you know yeah. so things like that um practices like that prevent that from happening but tools like meditation which really is not affiliated with any religion at all like pretty much any monk from any religion is going to meditate it's just a practice of being aware and mindful of, of your state of being um practices like uh I don't know, like, so, like gentleness and like communication and relationships and, um, you know, tools that we really should be teaching in our schools, like <laughs> pretty yeah. much right off the bat. Those are, those are tools that like, first of all, they're not, it's, it's not like a, a device that like gives you the answers, you know, it's literally like just listening to yourself, listening to what's happening inside of you and being curious um, that's literally the tool to self-discovery. That's the tool to understanding, you know, where your traumas are, where you're damaged, things like that. Um, but no one's, I, I, it's very discouraging for me to see how many people don't know how to handle their own psychology and their own emotions and their own thoughts. You know, they're, we're not given those tools. So we're just kind of like, the world just throws us out there. It's like, well, figure it out. You know, hopefully you land on your feet. Um, and there's, unless you go to counseling, unless you have something that happens, that's very difficult for you. Do you actually have to face that and work with it and figure out like, Oh, maybe I do need to listen to my feelings. I need to work through them. You know, sometimes it takes someone losing someone significant in their life or something really traumatic happening in their life for them to sit down and be like, okay, like, what, what do I really want in my life? And how do I, how do I get it? You know? Um, but if I think if we were taught that earlier on, instead of having it to be like a very bad scenario to trigger that, I think most likely we'd have a lot more self-aware people in the world, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's I mean, my short, long answer. It's, it's, I mean, none of it was, you know, something that we could have, uh, you know, excluded. All of it was important. I, we've we've come to the last question, Hayden. Uh, yeah. would, would you believe it, man? Would you would you fucking believe the shit right here? <laughs> <laughs> come to the last question. I'm going to ask you the last question, and then I'm going to also give you a really good like analogy, a good, okay. uh, you know, visual imagery almost. I love okay. it. I, I want you to have it also. Like it's 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 basically explaining what you explain, but in a short story uh, okay cool uh, all right so the last question is have these experiences changed you in any way and has it been a transformative experience yes okay we're done <laughs> <laughs> all right so so the analogy the analogy is this okay and this is what i I, when I came back to join my academic uh, degree, I took a break, right? I came back and I was supposed to write a report why I took a break. This is the only thing that I've written in the report. And they mm -hmm. let me in very easily <laughs> based on that, which mm -hmm. was, I was, when I was, uh, before the psychosis, before I took the academic break, I was running in a marathon and I was running and there were other people running with me and all of us were running in the marathon. And then someone tripped me and I was now on the floor and people sort of sidelined me, sidelined me to the side of the race. And now I'm just sitting and watching the other people run the marathon. And in this time, after, after observing these people, I asked myself three questions. And these are the three questions I'm going to try to answer now that I'm back in academics. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have the answers for these. And these, these two questions are, uh, did I choose to run in this race? What race is this? Okay, that's, that's the first question. The second question is, what if I let the person who was nudging me, pushing me like with the shoulder, what if I let him get ahead of me? How will that matter? Like, why am I, you know, with all my heart and soul trying to stop that from happening? What if it happens? And the third thing is, I finished the marathon. I'm at the end of the line. I clear the ribbon. Now what? You know, and these are, these are three things that it's a metaphor and it, the metaphor can be as big as you wanted to make it, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I am still trying to answer these three questions. You know, that's, 
basically it i'm not going to explain the metaphor to you but it 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 relates to what you just said before the last question you know the answer to which was yes before that uh it it it's <laughs> it's yeah i thought you should have that you know image and maybe uh explain it to like make your own meaning out of it you know like just mm. yeah man we're done we're done finally we are finished i'm so thankful i'm so uh grateful that you agreed to do this man there's a lot of gratitude uh, oh, uh yeah man thanks mm. like yeah we didn't know each other we were strangers but we shared like things that i haven't shared with my my parents my my friends you know like my friends know me uh okay for for a bit he he had some really like weird experiences intense experiences but they don't and they accept me back but they don't really understand this is very important to me that somebody understands the experience so yeah i mean great man i didn't know this could happen it's amazing yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's been my pleasure. I've I've loved talking with you too. Like, I hope that we stay in touch, you know. And obviously, like, I would love to have you on my YouTube channel. I think that would be amazing. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, like, sure. Probably, like, if you're down for more than just one, I think we both have a lot to talk about, and we'd have a lot to offer. So I think we have a lot more content than just one video. So if you'd want to do more than just one, I'd be down. We'll start with one, you know. And if it scares you off, and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa this is oh no, scary. no, I'm not. I, I mean. I I'm trying to make it as a musician, you know. I've I've got I have yeah. a YouTube channel as well, but I'm trying to I'm not doing anything related to psychosis there. So I'm trying to right. uh, do original music there. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the reason I'm sharing this is I don't have any qualms about this, you know. I would I'd love to get even this interaction out there in the public domain so that you know people can take away. I I'm not I understand the you know how this can help people. Like I'm not very. it's not about me basically that's what i'm trying to say it's not about me it's it's about what people are going to take from this so i'm i'm down man i'm down just that uh the research is going to keep me busy till may and yeah. i i will find out time of course i it's an obligation now almost that i put on myself i will find out time but i can't make promises you know like but i try my level best and i would love to do this i think is is yeah. is also a fun fun thing to do it's you fun know? Yeah it's, yeah, it's fun. I love doing it. It's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no rush. Like if you're busy till May, then we'll do it in May. Like I'll be doing YouTube like for the foreseeable future. So like if you're busy till May, that's that's fine. No, no, I mean I I can do it even even in between May and you also you have to promise me we'll write that book that you promised me in the beginning like when I started the interview like would you write a book with me? You asked me that. I thought mm -hmm. about it and I, I I don't mind. If if you're still on with that project of that writing, okay. I mean, I I mean, I just kind of said that. I mean, we'll see. Like, <laughs> I think it's a little early for that. But if, like, a relationship develops to that point. Then, like, All right. You know, okay, but, I understand. Now you're treating me like your ex, man. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you going to imitate my accent too? Like that Simpson character you did? Like in the am I recording? I should be recording.